Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Bite Size Talk. Um, I'm happy to present to you today uh, Sabrina Krakow. She is uh, situated at Cubic at the University of Tübingen, and she's talking to today about uh, the NFCore Pipeline MAG. And off to you. Okay, thanks, Francesca, for this kind introduction. Uh, I'm very happy that it uh, finally works out to also present the NFCore MAG Pipeline to all of you. And this pipeline you can use for metagenome hybrid assembly and binning. So um, the goal of this pipeline is to analyze microbial communities by recovering individual genomes. Um, this might be, for example, particularly useful if you do not have a complete set or high quality reference genomes given. So such microbial communities could be basically everything, for example, environmental samples, but also host associated communities such as the gut microbiome. And what can then be done is that the microbiome samples can be um, processed with beta genome shotgun sequencing, uh, which generates short reads. And the NFCore MAC pipeline then essentially um, combines these reads and assembles them to larger contexts. And then in a fine uh, downstream genome binning step, um, bins this context to so-called metagenome assembled genomes or also called max. And these max can then further be annotated and also taxonomically classified. So that's basically the concept of the NFCore MAC pipeline. And as for many NFCore pipelines, um, this the development of this was a, a quite large community effort. So with many different contributors. So just mentioning the main important ones, um, it was started by Adrian Goulet, um, then Daniel Straub contributed a lot since early on, um, then I joined, and also since last year, James Fellows Yates is the main contributor of this pipeline. And yeah, now I would like to mention the key features of this pipeline. So it can perform a hybrid assembly using both short Illumina and long nanopore reads. And this is useful because if you have assemblies generated only from short reads, they are often highly fragmented. Um, and by using additionally longer reads, this can improve um, the contiguity of such resulting assemblies. The pipeline also performs the genome binning step and uh, optionally also a binning refinement step, then can taxonomically classify the resulting bins and also provides a comprehensive QC statistics. And furthermore, it can utilize sample-wise group information. Um, this can be used for the core assembly this is important if you have data sets where you know that certain strains are present across multiple samples, such as within longitudinal data sets. Um, and because the core assembly can improve or increases the sequencing depth, and by this also allows to recover more lower abundant genomes. Um, additionally, the group information is also used for the computation of core abundances, which can be or which is used in the genome binning step. And um, furthermore, the pipe pipeline also allows the handling of ancient DNA um, because it's containing uh, ancient DNA validation sub workflow, which is rather specific for this pipeline. A previous version of this pipeline was already published at the beginning of this year in NAR Genomics and Bioinformatics. So if someone is interested in more details, um, you can also have a look at this application note. Yeah, so here you can see an um, overview already about the pipeline. So uh, the pipeline starts with different pre-processing steps and QC. Then the actual assembly is uh, performed with a final genome binning step. And here in green, you can see the processes or different tools that are run by default by this pipeline. And um, now I, in following, I would like to guide you through the different steps of this pipeline in more detail. Um, just first, how can we actually run it? So here you can see an example of the next flow command that is typically, typically used. And in order to run it with default settings, uh, just provide a sample sheet as input file. And um, here you can see an example how the sample sheet look like, looks like for this pipeline. So it contains five columns. The first column contains a sample name. The second column contains the group name. In this case, all samples belong to the same group. And then you have to provide the pass to the input read files, um, either only to the short reads or to the short and long reads. So the long reads are optional. Yeah, and starting with the sample sheet file now, or if you have only short reads, you can also just provide uh, fastq files directly. 
Um, the pipeline then pre-processes the short and long reads separately from each other with different pre-processing steps. I do not want to discuss them in detail. Maybe just mention that um, the host reads can also be removed by mapping the reads to given reference sequences. And this information um, is also used indirectly for the long reads um, since the long reads are filtered based on the already filtered short reads. Yeah, the short reads can then further be um, taxonomically classified already. This can serve, for example, as a, a quality control here in order to check for potential contaminations. Yeah, and um, after this pre-processing steps, then the actual assembly is um, done. This can be done sample-wise or the group information can be used in order to run a co-assembly. However, by default, this is done for each sample individually. And by default, um, the tools Bates and Megahit are run both. Um, however, you should keep in mind that if you have on long reads given and you are interested in the hybrid assembly, then only the tools Bates can be used for this. Um, then the tool Quest is also used in order to assess the quality of the resulting assemblies. And also the assemblies are further processed with the tool Prodigal, which predicts protein coding genes for this. Okay, that's the assembly part and the context of these assemblies are then further um, processed in the genome binning step where the tools MetaBud2 and MaxBin are used, um, which now bin the context to retrieve the actual genomes. Um, and the results of these tools can also further additionally be combined in a binning refinement step, which makes use of dust tool. Uh, the quality of this bin is as well um, assessed with the tool Quest, and in addition, the tool Busco is used, which makes use of single copy orthologs in order to estimate the contamination on the completeness of the retrieved genomes. And, um, and additionally, the pipeline also uses a custom script, um, which estimates the abundance of the individual bins, because it is also a relatively important output of this pipeline. Um, and further downstream processes, then um, the bins are further taxonomically classified by default using the tool GTDPTK and also annotated with the tool PROCA. And finally, then a multi QC report is generated and also a relatively comprehensive next summary report. So, how does the output of the pipeline? So, besides all the individual results file of the individual tools, the pipeline uh, generates. Um, Clustered heat map showing the lag abundances across different samples. So here you can see an example how this looks like. And if you would see here, for example, that certain samples cluster together the, for which you know that they are originating from different groups, this might indicate that something has gone wrong. And um, the pipeline also outputs a max summary, um, which I already mentioned. So this contains for each bin or each MAC. Um, the abundance information, so across different samples, the QC matrix um, from the Busco results and the Quest results, and also taxonomic classifications from the tool GTDBTK. Yeah, and with this, um, I've shown you the rough overview about the pipeline, and next I would like to show you now some of the uh, impact different assembly settings can have. So for this, I simulated some mouse Gut data set in the past already with the tool Kamisim, and I generated hybrid data, so containing um, Illumina data and nanopore reads, and generated two groups, so with each with a time series of four samples. So this is, might be the ex ideal case where a core assembly might be useful. And now I would li like to show you some of the resulting assembly um, metrics that are commonly used. So here you can see, for example, the total length of the resulting assemblies and then compared for different uh, pipeline ones where different um, assembly settings were used. So the um, lower two uh, pipeline settings correspond to a sample wise assembly and using either only short or short and long read, so hybrid data. Um, and the upper two settings correspond to a core assembly, um, again, with short or with short and long reads. And what we can see the, is that the total length of the resulting assemblies significantly increased both by using the hybrid setting and by um, applying the co-assembly setting. And uh, similar results we also see when looking at the number of MACs, so at the number of 
genomes that could be retrieved from this data, and also when looking at the N50 values. So this indicates that the actual setting that is used for the assembly within this pipeline, pipeline can have a relatively huge impact on the results. And um, it's definitely good that the pipeline um, provides different settings so that you can really choose the correct setting for your input data and it might also um, be worth to compare different settings. Um, another topic I would like to shortly mention are the resource requirements because this came up quite often already in the Slack channel and it's also somehow difficult to estimate um, in advance um, because it really differs dependent on your input data. And the main requirement are both for memory and time um, coming from the assembly step. And as I mentioned already, really differs for different input data sets. And I collected some numbers just to give you a rough idea um, for different pipeline ones that were run by Daniel Straub actually on our compute cluster. And for one rather small sample, what was a cultural sample, um, both mega hit and spades required less than 25 gigabytes and were finished in a couple of hours. However, for a larger river sample data set, it um, mega hit took already more than 100 gigabytes of RAM and it took more than one day to finish. And spades even took more than 900 gigabytes of memory and it required more than nine days. And there was another um, very large data set containing 15 soil samples for which also a core assembly was performed. And for this mega hit required one terabyte and more than 17 days. And spades could not even be one because it would have required more than two terabytes of memory. So this just shows that even for smaller data sets, you cannot run this on your laptop. Um, but in general, one can say that it depends on the sequencing depths, the number of samples, the complexity of the underlying metagenome, and also on the applied tool and setting. And for this, it might be worth noting that like both um, assembly tools are run by default, but MegaHit requires much fewer resources than space. And by the, if you do not um, want to compute a hybrid assembly, it might make sense to consider the skip space parameter. And additionally, the co-assembly also increases the required resources because it pools samples. Uh, so at least for one individual task, the required memory and time is much higher. So this is um, something important to keep in mind because also if you want to run it on larger data sets, you might want to um, provide a custom config file in order to adjust the resources required for your particular data set. And yeah, with this, we have seen how we can run the NF Core Mac pipeline for modern metagenomic data sets. And um, as I mentioned already at the beginning, it can also handle ancient DNA. So for this, James and Maxine added an ancient DNA validation sub workflow. And this is particularly interesting because as far as we know, at least, um, there, there's no other such pipeline which can handle ancient DNA. So what this essentially does is that it performs um, uh, identification of possible ancient context by modeling ancient DNA damage patterns and then polishes the context in order to remove the errors that are caused by the presence of such a ancient DNA damages um, in order to allow a more unpaired downstream analysis. So this might be interesting for some of you uh, to know that this pipeline can also handle ancient metagenomic data analysis. And with this, I'm already at the end of my presentation. So just a few words to the outlook. So the next release, which um, James already prepared, so it just requires one more review, will also contain uh, another optional binning tool, namely Concoct. Um, it will also allow optionally the um, uh, bin QC with check M and Gansi. And for the um, midterm future, it would be also very nice if um, a functional annotation step could be added. So depending on the strategy, either, for example, using human three or ECNOC, and also a standalone long read assembly option would be very nice um, by using, for example, uh, the tool Metafly um, such that the pipeline could be also one without short read data. And in general, if you are interested in contributing or if you have any questions or problems you would like to discuss, so you can join us in the and of course Slack channel dedicated for the Mac pipeline or have a look at our GitHub repository. Um, we're always happy about feedback or and particular bug reports and issues.
And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, then particular my, my um, colleagues from Cubic, and importantly Daniel Straum for many contributions, um, James and Maxime from the MPI for Evolutionary Anthropology, um, Adrian, of course, and importantly, the whole and of course core team and community for helping with the development, for reviewing, testing, and creating issues. And with this, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, there is indeed uh, one question already in the chat. Um, it was at the very beginning when you were talking about examples, and uh, you mentioned Kamisim. And uh, yeah. could you explain more in detail what this is? Um, this is a, a tool which uh, was also used in the Kami challenge um, to simulate metagenomics data. Um, it's yeah, basically using as input different genome sources. So I used in this case um, like a set of geno mouse genome sources, with, which was um, given from some mouse Got data sets, and then it simulate. Yeah, it can simulate Evoluina and Nanopore data, and simulate also different taxonomic profiles. Um, but the yeah, more details I would also have to look up. Now it's quite a while ago. Yeah. Was there any particular much. question about this? No, it was just a question. What is Camisim? But I think uh, James has now added some um, some links to articles. So uh, if anyone is interested. They can have a look at that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so for anyone else, if there are more questions, uh, you can now unmute yourself uh, and just ask them straight away, or you can put them in the chat and I will read them out for you. Uh, I, I would actually have a question. Um, what happens to multi-mappers? I can imagine that if you have like related bacteria that it would also map to uh, different ones. How, how does the pipeline deal with that? Uh, I mean, this is handled by the um, assembly tools then somehow. <laughs> um, but are they removed or added to all of them or any idea? Is there some like, I don't know if someone of the others are more in the details of this algorithmic part, parts of the assembler. Um, um, Francesca, do, do you mean when you're mapping back to the contigs or during the assembly itself? Uh, during the assembly. I mean, I wouldn't, you map to that, the genomes, I guess. No, so the, the well, so we need to explain the, the main concept there, but basically there's some fancy maths magic that goes on which estimates which reads most likely go with each other based on the number of um sort of mutations they have with each other and there's some yeah weird math stuff which works out which is the best grouping <laughs> uh, okay then i mis misunderstood that part thank you um are there any more questions from the audience it doesn't seem so if you have any more questions later on as you mentioned you can always go to and of course slack and ask questions there um, so if this is now all the questions answered so far, I would like to thank uh, Sabrina again for this um, very nice talk. And of course, as usual, I would also like the, to thank the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative for funding the Bite Size Talks. And of course, everyone in the audience for listening. Thank you very much. Thanks.